I'd like to show you uh, one more videotape. Um, uh, if I haven't, uh, to me it's very convincing. <laughs> I could see myself lying in bed, all curled up, you know, and I could see my bed and just kind of, you know, just things around my bed, and I could just see myself lying there, and I looked awful, because <laughs> I had a, you know, and then... You could actually see yourself? Mm -hmm. Could you see, like, the top of your head, or...? No, I was looking down on myself. I was mm -hmm. looking down at myself, and then... Could you see other things around the room? Just... You know how you look down and you can kind of see. So I kind of saw some of the the, the end table where you put mm -hmm. your stuff, and I kind of saw I saw the bed posts and I saw things around me. But how about the floor? Um, I don't really remember. No, I don't think I and then I was, and I went back. Then I was like in my body, I was in my body, and then then my spirit or something just went. <laughs> And it like vacuumed out, and it just then I was like free, you know, and I was all, you know, relaxed and light, and and I was feeling good and feeling better than I've ever felt. And then I floated up to the top of the room, like really fast, you know. <laughs> and then I looked down at myself, and I saw myself, you know, on the bed again and being all miserable and everything. And then suddenly I was like zoom at the end of a tunnel at the left tunnel. And then I was in this bright light. This patient has not had a near-death experience. This patient has temporal lobe seizures. No doubt about it. But I believe strongly death-related visions in general. I think once we have an understanding that these experiences are rooted in our own neurobiology, this is actually explains a wide variety of different types of spiritual experiences surrounding death and dying. And it's that this represents one of several associative abilities of the mind mediated by our right temporal lobe. Now we can understand, for example, why when someone has had a death, when a parent uh, has a child die, they frequently see that child after the child dies. That experience, which many parents report, and widely reported in the medical literature as well, they, it's very similar to a near-death experience to them. It's vividly real. They see their child superimposed over ordinary reality. It's enormously comforting. Now we can understand the numerous reports of shared dying experiences. Uh, Dr. Furukawa, uh, an allergist uh, at my hospital, uh, describes that when his son died, he had a related spiritual experience in which he felt he was drawn out of his physical body. And that a being or a presence said to him, you know, sort of in words, do you want to die with your son or do you want to return to life to the worst emotional pain that you will ever suffer? You know, he was not going through the, through the dying process. He was just, in some kind of uh, intangible way, sharing the son's dying experience. And we have many documented experiences. In the nursing literature, for example, many experiences of nurses actually perceiving their patient's death, nurses having dreams in the middle of the night in which their patient will come to them and say, you know, I'm dying, thank you so much, uh, you know, this kind of comforting message. Now we understand premonitions of death. Uh, I have a patient who had a um, baby die of sudden infant death. She brought her, ba her baby uh, into me the day before the baby died. She said, something is horribly wrong with my baby. Something's wrong with my baby. And the baby seemed normal. I said, no, you're just having the normal fears that every new parent has. And she said, no, this is different. Can't you run some tests? Uh, I couldn't think of any tests to do. The baby died of SIDS uh, later that night. I felt horribly guilty about it. All I could think was, was I should have hospitalized that kid. I should have listened to that mother. And yet, when I talked to the mother, after, interestingly enough, not until she had another baby could she talk to me about it. I asked her, I said, 
why did you bring your baby in that bed? She told me she had had a dream the night before. A dream in which she floated it out of her body and an angel stood next to her. And the two of them looked down on her sleeping form and this angel said, you know, she will not be able to keep that baby. And that was it. That was her dream. Well, that dream is very different than the ordinary fears that parents have. You know, that's different. I have five children, and I've gotten up in the middle of the night and run in there to see if they're still breathing or not. When the Southwest SIDS, uh, SIDS uh, study group, um, which is the nation's largest SIDS uh, research group, when they did a study of this very issue, they found that 25% of parents have such an experience related to their infant's death. 25%. We did, uh, with that study, we did three separate control groups to try to look at the issue of, you know, maybe such dreams are common. Maybe everybody's having such a dream, and it's just coincidental that a baby would die. I did a prospective control group uh, for them uh, in my own office, in which I had parents write down their dreams for their newborn, about their newborn babies in the first year of life. And um, we did not find uh, that such dreams were common at all. In fact, in our control groups, uh, they did not report uh, that kind of a vivid, out-of-body, meeting an angel who then made a specific uh, prediction of some sorts uh, about their life. Well, I know that this sounds then, well, what's he trying to say? Is, is this experience, is it spiritual? Or is it just neurobiologically based? Do you know? Here's what the problem is. The problem comes with our understanding of what is dissociation. Or Michael Persinger, when he writes a brilliant article on the, the right temporal lobe, he says religious experiences as an artifact of dysfunction. We don't even have philosophically neutral words to describe this experience. Dissociation, this is uh, from my uh, textbook of uh, my, my medical dictionary, is described as a defect in mental integration in which parts of consciousness split apart and function as a separate entity, separate misspell. Um, defect. Why do we assume that these experiences are necessarily defects? Perhaps they represent the normal functioning of our brain to interpret and allow us to understand our own spiritual selves. And I'm proposing an entirely different view of what we call mental dissociation. I'm saying there's a wide variety of normal such experiences. Death-related visions, near-death experiences, spiritual visions in general. They're extremely common, and there's no reason to think uh, that they represent anything uh, but what the person says that they do. They, they represent, uh, in the near-death experience, for example, the only objective evidence of what it's like to die. And they specifically say that they encounter some sort of meaningful experience with a spiritual part either of themselves or of something spiritual outside their body. Then you have the out-of-body experience, which I believe to be just simply the sort of the neurophysiological dry run uh, just sort of the, the, the function of our right temporal lobe for no particular reason. Joggers have this, for, uh, for example. Many joggers, when they're, uh, you know, are marathon runners, when they get out to about 20 miles, they'll just pop out of their body. No spiritual aspect to it at all. And then you have the pathological aspects of it, which I think other uh, authors and thinkers have sort of brushed everything with, the psychotic visions and then ultimately multiple personality disorder. So it's my opinion... And, and I'm going to challenge you all to, to think of these experiences in a different way, is that, these, that the near-death research actually validates these pre-death visions and these after-death what people have called hallucinations. Certainly, I'll just tell you, it's changed my own practice in medicine. When I have a baby die in my practice now, I simply have the parents come back about six weeks later, and I'll sit with them 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever it takes, and I might at most gently say to them, you know, sometimes parents think that they see their child again after their child died. What could be more bland and neutral than that? And yet that simple statement usually will bring tears. They will start crying. Yes, I knew it was, it was true. I thought I was going crazy. But now I know it's true. I did see my baby again. And then allowing them 
to make their own meaning and understanding of the experience. Just like I do with infant colic. No different. I don't, for example, when a mother comes in with infant colic, a colicky infant, I don't say, well, you know, recent studies have shown that your baby really doesn't cry more than any other baby, but you just have a lot of psychosocial stress in your life. And that's <laughs> you know, you just think your baby cries more. And, you know, I, I'd have to have two patients in my practice if I did that. I simply say, tell me what it's like to have such a baby that cries all the time. And then they say, they make their own meaning of it. They say, you're right, you're right, you know, as if I had really said something. They'll say, well, I don't care about the baby crying. It's my mother-in-law. It's making me feel like a bad mother. Or they'll say, you know, they'll tell you what that experience means to them. The same is true of these spiritual experiences. Simply validate them as normal, as natural. It's clearly a part of the human condition. They are as real as any other experience. They have a whole hunk of our brain devoted uh, to allowing us to have them. They're as real as math. They're as real uh, as um, calculus. Uh, they're as, uh, as real uh, as language. These experiences are very common. Don't be fooled by thinking, uh, you know, so oftentimes people say to me, well, I didn't have a near-death experience. Uh, when I died, I just saw a light. And, you know, they've uh, read too many books about what it was supposed to be like. Usually the experiences are very mundane. People will come up to me and they'll say, now I know with that brush at, at the, my shoulder and, and that kind of whisper in my ear, I, I, I thought I heard a voice say, I, I love you, goodbye, thank you. Now I know what that means. These experiences are rarely dramatic. And our dramatic understanding of these glorious views of another life simply distracts us from understanding that these experiences are very, very common and usually overlooked. They clearly can generate meaning to death, which is essential for grief resolution. To me, it, it, it's, it's incomprehensible that you can read textbook after textbook of the death and dying literature, of grieving, of the SIDS literature, brilliant books, and you never hear spiritual visions discussed once. And yet, what is more powerful from the patient standpoint, when these experiences occur anywhere, depending on the study, from 10 to 75 percent uh, of the time when a family has had a death, what could be more powerful than these experiences? They help in all of the tasks of mourning. Accepting the reality of loss, experiencing the pain of grief, adjusting to a new environment, reinvesting emotional energy. You know, the fact that our grieving literature is silent on these issues represents what I was telling you about at the beginning of the lecture is our profound philosophical bias that these experiences are any more than artifacts of a dysfunctional brain. They're not artifacts of a dysfunctional brain. Uh, you know, there's no evidence to support that, but think about it. If our bias is that, is that they're artifacts, well then of course they are not of any importance in counseling our patients. If we turn control to the dying, maybe they'll bring back the old deathbed scene. Now people understand that the dying person has something to share with us. The dying moments, a smile on the face, a peaceful look, a fragment of a conversation. Usually we think when people die, they have nothing more to share with us. They feel, you know, they're, they're disempowered. <laughs> if people don't, don't want to talk to them. Uh, we spend briefer time talking to them. Now that we know that, uh, that they can actually hear and emotionally process conversations, which again, everybody recognizes, regardless of their philosophical viewpoint as being true, it's a good time to say goodbye. It's a good time to hold someone's hand. 